As an acupuncturist in southern Idaho, I get three questions commonly. Number one, is this going to hurt? Two and three, how did you get into this kind of work and how did you get here to southern Idaho? Well, for me, the story starts as a teenager when I find some clarity in the contemplative disciplines of yoga, meditation, and a Chinese variant called stance keeping, holding fixed postures for long periods of time. I found clarity at a time in life when things are not so clear. I was impressed by the health benefits of regulating my body, my breathing, my mind, and I felt a sense of empowerment, personal transformation. Acupuncture was something I was exposed to at this time, and it seemed like the right next move for me, my destiny. I wanted to actually master acupuncture and related arts, so I knew that it would take a long time for deep feeling and for experience to accumulate. So alongside the training, the preparation, and the schooling, I searched for a place to practice conducive to this kind of lifestyle. Idaho. Clean air, clean water, no traffic, abundant nature. Seemed like a golden opportunity, perfect place for me to live. Intriguingly, not long after arriving here, I was approached in my office by an elderly couple, and they brought with them diary accounts of her great-grandparents going by a horse-drawn buggy to see this man a Chinese acupuncturist in John Day, Oregon, around the turn of the 20th century. Well, some would say it's just a coincidence, but for me, I felt something kind of special that day. For me, the experience kind of connected me. Where I was and what I was doing, I thought, with a little piece of American history. And it meant something. It was confirmatory. Well, I hate to have to share with you guys a little bit of dark reality, but every story has got it, right? For the first 10 of the 12 years that I've been doing this, I had two offices 80 miles apart, and I commuted back and forth. I maintained two offices, two residences, two kitchen sinks, two refrigerators, two lives. A real life tale of two cities. Well, it turned out to be a little too much. I knew and believed in my talent and expertise, but the business was hard. Nobody taught me about that. Standing on one leg in a deep knee bend for an hour a day did not adequately prepare me for the challenges of entrepreneurship. Many others know the squeeze that I'm talking about, but it wouldn't be long in my own rendition of the play before I would have the first stirrings of what became a long and difficult battle with my health, with peptic ulcer disease in my stomach. One I'm proud to say I've triumphed from, but one admittedly that hurt me, set me back, caused a lot of pain to my personal life, to my loved ones, and just a lot of pain in general. So after 10 years, I was awakened, slowly, to the wastefulness and improbability of continuing. The mobile nature of life as it was then organized was confining and killing me. Helping people inspired me to persevere, and being productive somehow made the suffering less. I think it's important to convey how instinctively adaptable we all are as humans in the face of adversity. If anyone's wondering what it feels like to have a peptic ulcer for 12 years, if you've ever eaten a bad oyster, you have some idea of what I'm talking about. And if you ever did the experiment as a kid where you made a bubble bomb out of baking soda 
and vinegar. Now you have it spot on. But seriously, in the sleeplessness of 4,000 nights, every single one of them, while I sat up waiting for my dysfunctional stomach to empty itself one way or another way, I did learn to be more humble, more empathetic, more compassionate. I also learned that when you can't get past your adversity, you must lean in and grow up to it. So where things were dire for me during this time, they weren't all bad. And by day I was mastering a unique craft which helps a lot of people. And this has turned out to be a very valuable thing. Okay. Somewhere about five years ago I had a really fun thing happen. I stumbled upon this. An unlikely vehicle of personal, social, and professional transformation. My first bus was kind of a mishap, but a much needed diversion from work and health problems. It led me to lots of adventures and over the road experiences. Buses make people smile. They're iconic, they're safe, and they're American as apple pie. Traveling over the road in a school bus is an adventure like no other. This one was filled with freedom, fun, joy, friends, and in many communities. Now would you let that guy put needles in you? <laughs> Me neither. Well, traveling around in this bus was a lot of fun. But I had thoughts obsessively about getting another one, a bigger one. One that might work as a living space, something that could help me consolidate my life, which was already requiring major adaptations. I read online forums at night where others were doing this, like schoolies.net. Schoolies is a word for school buses repurposed. And schoolies.net is a website where bus nuts go to talk about their conversion projects. One day I was working with a woman in my office who was accompanied by her husband, Frank. He patiently waited until I was through with her acupuncture, and he asked me what I like to do in my free time. I told him I liked buses, and that I had been eyeing one, a new one, for purchase. He grinned and puffed his chest out and graciously said, I think you ought to come by my place after work. I'd like to show you my shop and some things that might be of value to you. So I did. I knew as I arrived on this man's property that something great was about to happen. Turns out this 76 year old also liked buses. A lot. And he had a lot of them. Turns out, I find out this man's also known as Frank I.D., his screen name on the Schoolies website I had so often been reading. He was clearly one of the most knowledgeable on many subjects, and he had been guiding others for years in their own bus conversions. What a serendipitous meeting. And so it began. What began? A kind of rebirth for me and my new bus. Well, sparing you guys some of the grotesque details of my own rebirth, I'll tell you a little more of it. At a certain point in my 12-year battle, I could physically stand no more. Nothing was going to help me with the mechanical obstruction inside my body, except for mechanical bypass. And so, I surrendered. But thanks to my epic holdout, complete with all the stubbornness and green vegetables I could get my hands on, and advances in robotic surgery, 
I'm pleased to say it from Ryder's reign. It's like it never happened. At least six months before and after this event, my bus and me saw a continued upgrade. My bus, after receiving a number of mechanical tune-ups, garnered an electrical system. Plumbing. Liquid propane gas. Furniture. Fixtures. Hardware. Chrome. Steel, brass, switches, flitches, funnel headed witches, <laughs> paint jobs, jack jobs, whack jobs, machine work, bench work, camera work, more work, toolboxes, LEDs, inside lights, outside lights, reverse lights, drive lights, indicator lights and on and on and on and on and on. But the beauty of all of this was that it was all according to my design. And with mentorship from my old pal Frank, the sky was the limit. And if I didn't like something, I changed it, and I still do. And somehow, like with the last bus, my friends arrived, and they brought smiles, cookies, sewing machines, and a good time was had by all. Well, so I had this great bus, and I had my health back. I could sleep lying down. Hell, I could end here, clap for myself, and leave you guys. This is... <laughs> but then I had another idea. Why don't I use my bus for work? Why not spread the joy? I knew from my years of experience that house calls in a rural community were of value. Access to effective health care was a ubiquitous issue. People are isolated by geography, infirmity, their work schedules, or just lack of awareness. Getting people, place, and timing together was a problem worth trying to solve. So, some sheet metal, a grinding wheel, some paint, and some modification to modifications, and then we had this. Now, if I had known at outset that I was going to use this bus as a mobile office, I would have done a lot of things differently. But if I had known I was going to run myself ragged by trying to run two brick and mortar offices, make myself sick, I probably would have done that differently too. But I know this because I've lived it, I hurt, I struggled, and I learned. And I'm forever grateful, and I'm forever transformed. I want to show you guys a short clip of me and the bus in Idaho working together. But before I do, I just want to say one more thing. On the day I auditioned to do this TED Talk, a very important person in my life and in the acupuncture community died. His name was Richard Tan. Richard was a systems engineer and acupuncturist, and he created an algorithm called the Balance Method. There have been other greats in acupuncture history, but I think Richard deserves mention for collating the major concepts of acupuncture and bringing it forward into the modern age. So to him, I'd raise a glass if I had one. Thank you for your attention. Enjoy the flick. Have you ever had acupuncture before? No. 
Are you worried about it? A little bit. spasms that I'm having post-operative and I've never had acupuncture before. As it turns out sometimes the bus is a little cumbersome. For instance the bus doesn't have a wheelchair lift but in that case we just do whatever is required. Hi Brenda, how are you doing? Well, my shoulder is doing fantastic. While we were on our trip yesterday, Ralph injured his shoulder and his shoulder is in pain today. Ouch. Ouch. Have you ever had acupuncture before? No. Are you worried about it? A little bit. <laughs> Yeah, that works. Yeah, it's east or west as long as it works. Mm -hmm. I really don't have no pain there at no. all. This is weird. <laughs> um, out here, we kind of stick together. Word travels fast, good or bad. Um, 